Welcome everyone to this uh, very final session of the Critical Making Mentoring Program that we held in the last um, yeah, nine months. Um, and it's my special pleasure to introduce you to Aravind Panch, who will speak to us about including ecosystem services in your making. And Aravind has an extensive um, experience in the topic that he will show us more about in a minute. Uh, and I'm especially yeah, happy that we make it possible that he today introduces the topic of ecosystem services because Aravind was one of the people um, back in 2019 who actually co-created uh, with many other global makers and makerspace uh, hosts and uh, managers the sustainable making principles from the global innovation gathering and he introduced um, the topic of ecosystem services back then uh, and everybody really loved um, the approach and now uh, just a few years later and one pandemic later um, we're uh, finally taking the chance to have more deeper understanding of that and also better discussion uh, amongst more um, globally um, dispersed um, makers um, who are now here with us uh, in the session. So I'm handing over to Aravind, who is uh, co-founder and also uh, co-director of Dreamspace Academy in Sri Lanka. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Um, the virtual applause is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just want to test if uh, if you all of you can hear me. It's all good. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Sandra. And uh, as, uh, as you mentioned that I've been part of this uh, uh, foundation, this principle for quite some time. And uh, <clears throat> but we never, uh, this is the first time that I'm presenting it in a in a workshop workshop format. And it's still uh, ecosystem services are very still um, unknown topic to a lot of people apart from certain uh, academic background but yeah so I want to today tell a little bit more about what we do why we do and uh, so that you get to know like you know our background uh, behind the scenes and then I will uh, lead uh, the talk into the ecosystem services critical making sustainable making all those topics and then um, and we can keep that as an open platform for uh, discussing probably you know some you might have heard ecos you might have seen application of ecosystem services in your community but you would have never thought that there is a scientific term used to 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 define that yeah so uh, a little bit behind the scenes um, as uh, what i want to uh, say like what we do at dream space and uh, why we do what we do so it again falls back to my story uh, of me i was uh, born in Sri Lanka at the time, uh, there were several uh, family members in my family were killed uh, in the war during the first uh, peak of the war in 1980s. And uh, um, as you might, many of you might relate uh, to the situation, um, especially in, in African countries, similar situations. And uh, so the, the war was going for quite a long time. So the longer the war, the younger the soldier. So at the age of 14, I was uh, forced to be a child soldier um, as uh, the 20 years after the war have uh, elapsed. There were not much people and uh, left in the country. And um, at that moment, I had to, uh, to run away from, uh, from the family to, to escape uh, not being a child soldier, going to the war field and so on. And so I became a child refugee uh, in another country nearby. Uh, away from the family and uh, where, you know, basically I was a child refugee who was made into a stateless person. So I didn't have any opportunity to to stay in a place or, you know, no name, no address, no bank accounts, no, no was not allowed to go to school and so on. But yeah, eventually I found the way around. But in that period of time, uh, being a child refugee, refugee uh, um, in a teenage and in another country that uh, I had to do a lot of things myself because I was not given that opportunity uh, to be like a yet another kid going to school or something like that. So at that moment, I learned a lot of things myself, as which is very relevant for this topic, critical making and sustainable making. The, mo the movement of make a movement itself is 
unconventional way of uh, doing things and learning things. And then I learned a lot of things to solve my problems. So at that moment, I learned that uh, I'm the only one who can solve my problems. So for, whether it's my personal problem, my social or environment problem, I have to solve it myself. I cannot wait for a superhuman to come and solve these challenges. And that's how I uh, spent uh, nine years, 10 years of my time as a refugee. And then when the war ended after 30 years, uh, I was able to, to go back. And then I saw that the, this huge, yeah, three decades of the war caused a huge impact on our socioeconomic and environmental ecosystem. Like your places uh, in Sri Lanka also, there were so many international aid organizations, pretty much every INGO were based in Sri Lanka, but they couldn't solve this, our local challenges sustainably because of course they were providing significant support. So at that moment, you know, as a person who spent 24 years of life as a war child or child soldier or child refugee, um, see seeking for a purpose, uh, I understood that my purpose is to empower the locals to solve these complex local challenges. And that is how we started as a peace building initiative. And, and then later we pivoted into a, into a nonprofit social enterprise tackling this uh, you know, socioeconomic and environmental challenges through challenge-based learning, grassroots innovation, and impact ventures. So education, innovation, and entrepreneurship were the pillars to achieve the sustainable development goals. So whom we wanted to empower was like underserved communities initially in the war affected region, but at a certain point, as we are a peace building organization, we have to also expand to other regions and from the other communities. And, and uh, that was one of our mission. So after being operational for uh, five, six years, uh, doing a lot of uh, impact uh, to the socioeconomic and environmental ecosystem, we identified that we really wanted to be a self-sustaining ecosystem, some form of a special economic zone for local and international change makers to come co-learn co-innovate, co-live, co-farm, and co-manufacture uh, so that, you know, we can um, um, co-create the next generation um, change makers and enterprises to make this Sri Lanka region as the as one of the innovation hub in, in the South and Southeast Asia. So that has become the solid vision for us, and we are working towards that, and I can tell you a little bit more about it. So how do we empower? So why all this is very relevant for ecosystem services is because how we identify our challenges in our ecosystem, environmental ecosystem is leading to this innovation. That is the whole point of telling our process before we go into the theory of ecosystem services. So how do we empower? We call it dream space life cycle, which is a five stage process. Uh, Dream space is an organization which is working top down, uh, top down approach. We are not an organization with a certain program, and then we look for people and change makers, and then they train them. We are the other way around. First, we we first we identify people who can become change maker, and then we build up the whole program, infrastructure, knowledge, whatever is necessary for them, and then that becomes a vertical of our our knowledge base also. So in this five stage process, the first stage project uh, process, maybe like I will go a little bit in a story based uh, so I can show you here. This is the first stage is one of our change maker. Um, uh, <clears throat> so when he was at, uh, 16, 17 years old, he had the motivation to to promote, uh, you know, make a change in the society. That is the fundamental thing that we look at our change maker, whether that person has the motivation to make a change. It doesn't, they don't have to know how to make a change, whether it's in the society or the environment. So he was promoting uh, environmental ecosystems and he walked from the north tip to the south tip of Sri Lanka, 600 kilometers in 12 days to promote peace. And, and he climbed the, uh, the Mount Elbrus and he's the first Sri Lankan Tamil teenager to promote the environmental and physical and mental health. So we identify these change makers and then we know that, okay, this person, it has a the motivation. Now we have to put, you know, a certain framework for them to become, you know, create the impact. So at the next stage, what we do is basically when we identify the change maker, we go to their parents. Most of the time we have to uh, take them out of the home and then we have to keep them with us more, almost like adoption that we have to keep them for two years. We feed them, accommodate them. We do everything for them for majority of the, the, of the change makers because they come from very vulnerable societies, jungles, villages, and like sometimes even mental asylums and juvenile homes, 
rehabilitation center. So we take them out of, we bail them out of that vulnerable society uh, situation. And then in the second stage, we identify what is the challenge that they are victim of. So this is very important aspect, even for ecosystem services, is a very important aspect that what is the challenge that you are the true victim of? Because a lot of people can you know, try to solve a challenge which they are not victim of, but we believe that if you identify the right people to, that they are victim of the particular challenge, and then they are the right people to solve those challenges. So once we go through that analysis, psychoanalysis uh, process of identifying the person's challenges and needs and so on, we know that what could be the solutions for those challenges. So what we do basically to whatever the knowledge that person needs to solve those challenges, we give them through this challenge-based education, challenge-based learning model. So it's not a subject-based or a project-based, it's a challenge-based education based on a challenge. Whatever they need to learn to solve the challenge is that when they train, get trained. So it could be a very social innovation or it could be very non-technical like peace building, storytelling, you know, photography to very technical like electromechanics, biotechnology, nanotechnology, space tech, whatever you can imagine. So every change maker, every story, every uh, uh, challenge is different. So we have to personalize that. That's what we call it is as a personalized empowerment. And the third stage, after a certain period of six plus months of training and the, the change maker doesn't go to university or school or what, any kind of other institutional education because they don't have access to it, that being an underserved uh, you know, youngster. Uh, and uh, in that stage, once they get all the training from us, the change maker is developing a solution to tackle that challenge face the challenge. You know, you may not be able to solve the challenge as a corporate or a government, but you can tackle and face the challenge. And this is a very important aspect also for ecosystem services that we need to actually see and face those challenges and tackle and value, you know, to understand the challenges. So in this case, he comes from a um, coastal uh, region and he saw that biodiversity, the marine biodiversity caused a lot of socioeconomic challenges for the fishing villages around the you know, loss of fishes and they lose the you know their economic income and livelihood when they don't when they catch you know they don't have much um, uh, uh, fishes and then they're sitting most of the time alone and then they can then you know idle mind is devil workshop they can go and have a conflict with someone else in another community so we all the way it goes back to that peace building process of what we do so he said that okay Sri Lanka's ocean is seven times the size of our land, seven times the size of our land. So what do we know about our ocean as a country? We know very less un, you know, that we know about our ocean. So he said that if we have to protect our ocean, the marine biodiversity, we actually have to uh, have a system uh, that can autonomously, autonomously profile what's happening under the water. So it's an underwater glider. It's not an underwater drone, which is a limited range and is underwater glider. It glides in the ocean current for a longer distance, few months, and it can profile different things. And it's, again, it's an open source project from, um, uh, for, we, we uh, met this far, the author of the project, and then we can, took it over and then we further developed it and added, you know, added contribution to that. So that is how the grassroots innovation is being developed. The fourth stage. But we are an organization, we have interdisciplinary knowledge, but it's not, uh, when we identify a change maker, we narrow it down to the specific domain where this change maker is gonna work throughout his or her life to solve a particular challenge. We need a lot of international uh, experts and subject matter experts and scientists and, and you know, open innovators to come and contribute uh, their probably 20, 30 years of knowledge to this open organization. And that is what happening in the fourth stage. We bring in these experts stay to Sri Lanka and they stay with us few few weeks or month to, to transfer that domain specific knowledge. At the same time, we are also creating a story of the change maker solving the particular ecosystem challenge. And then we send it out to different international organization and Sanjeevan, uh, when he was uh, 17, 18 years old. And uh, uh, so he got this opportunity to be trained at Plokan. Plokan is the, the only deep sea exploration research center in the middle of Atlantic Ocean, where they have all those uh, you know, deep underwater exploration devices and gadgets and equipments. 
And what you see here is this uh, uh, yellow color underwater glider cost 200,000 euros and uh, uh, Norwegian glider. And so Sanjeevan got this opportunity to learn, but at the same time, um, we are the, the the solution that we have is 2000 euros probably around 100 times cheaper than this 200000 euro glider which is open sourced we indigenize that solution to our local uh, ecosystem so that means that we are able to repair it maintain it upgrade it and do whatever with that but if a country like sri lanka imports or buys or even some international ngo ingo or any other organization is pay, paying for this very expensive uh, foreign imported technology, we won't be able to maintain it, repair it, and, and you know, to, to use it efficiently. So that is the that is the one of the purpose is, is of, of our open innovation. And that's then the fourth stage. And uh and also to give a little bit of uh, coming from that ecosystem, that when you see like a lot of youngsters going through the through this way of education, a lot of families would not accept it. But you know, giving them an international exposure, you know, kind of helps us to win their families and parents. And uh, Sanjeevan was the, I think in, in that batch, he was the only one who didn't have any formal education in oceanology. And he was the only Asian or the Global South person to get you know, that selected for the program. And then and this is all a bigger opportunity that has been provided through this methodology. So the last stage, nothing is, is gonna be making sense unless we make a, a you know, an, venture or a startup or organization, either it can be for profit or non-profit, unless you don't build that, you know, all other things, the education that you had is going to be just not going to be applied. The innovation that you made is not going to be deployed. And so you need to have an organization to build and continue to do this work. And this is one of the principle and build for continuity. I'll come back to that in the sustainable making. So at that stage, we are spinning off of a change maker as an organization before that, we also train the change maker with everything that's necessary from business modeling, you know, pitching, elevator pitching, financial modeling, company formation, team building, company culture, whatever that's necessary to become an entrepreneur. And then we spin them off as, as, a, as, a, as a change maker and entrepreneur. And this is, is, the, is the stage where they graduate and it's usually 18 to 20 months. And then still they don't leave our infrastructure. They are part of us and they do it as a for-profit or non-profit. They contribute back to the... Dream Space Foundation, and um, and in this way, we know that, uh, for example, let's say like Ocean Biome, Sanjeevan's organization is 21 years old. I mean, he even made a, his team made a very big uh, uh, achievement just yesterday. They were the one of his team, uh, they had a campaign and he was swimming 32 kilometers the strait, the, the ocean between Sri Lanka and India yesterday, they crossed by swimming for 12 hours to promote the ocean biodiversity. It was yesterday's news. So basically ocean biome, and he has around 25 plus people working in this in organization, he's still 21 years old. He has never been to university. And a lot of these people were ocean, ocean uh, enthusiasts, or oceanologists in country like Sri Lanka, probably in, in your case in, in, in many countries in, in South, uh, Global South. When someone studies oceanology, the maximum respectable job that they get is a clerk job in a bank. That's the words that they have because there's no industry. So with this way, we are not only building a change maker, but we are also building a, a deep tech and hard tech or kind of a very uh, core uh, uh, industry that can mature in, in 15, 20 years so that our, our youngsters, they don't have to become asylum seekers in Europe or labor workers in Middle East. And we can find our opportunity in our country. So that is what we see this our model as a you know as a true peace building. I mean, even in the gig uh, 2019 in, in in Nakuru, we even had one track open science for peace building, and this is one of the biggest example that you know we are using peace building as the foundation, and whatever we do around that is to achieve the peace building process and reconciliation. So. What have we done? And it's a change maker building is a very intensive thing. So it's uh, it takes two and two years of time, a lot of money, and a lot of personalized empowerment. So it it is not you cannot do hundreds or thousands of people. So uh, that's what uh, we have a uh, this number of change maker we have actually created. And uh, during this process, we also find a lot of people who didn't want to be the full scale change maker. They come in and learn a skill or something, and then we have uplifted 
more than 1,500 uh, trainees uh, and, and then build several labs and innovations and ventures. So as I mentioned, Sanjeevan and Ocean Biome are, are, is not the only innovation, only change maker. We have all different types from, you know, organic nano uh, technology to synthetic biology to uh, gas, uh, biogas, uh, upcycling, biocomposite material, agriculture, biotechnology, AI, all different types of grassroots innovation solving a certain challenge. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's every challenge, every story is different. So that's why we have a few more dozen projects that we can present. And as you can see that since we are going very interdisciplinary, we, we have to build several multiple labs so that you know we can sustain these uh, change makers and the innovation. So we have everything from storytelling to, to biotechnology. Uh, we have built all these labs based on identifying the change maker and their challenges and what their solutions are. So at a certain time, we have to also grow our mass in the infrastructure. So we, you know, we want to produce things locally to bring the local manufacturing. So we have our own manufacturing facility uh, with uh, industrial machines that where we can produce wood, plastic, metal, and so on. And then at a certain point of time, we have grown to a bigger uh, group of people. So we always wanted to be like a village. And so we started building our own village at the peninsula. One side is ocean, one side is backwater. It's a five acre land where we build like labs and accommodation, restaurants, farms, and everything in within that space so that we can create that, you know, uh, a concentrated focused impact. As I mentioned, a lot of international experts were supporting us and uh, we are not only focusing on scientific, uh, uh, you know, advancement. We do a lot of peace building and well-being advocacies and building communities and rural development, women empowerment and so on. We have a pretty big team now, like 40 plus people full time and 100 plus in project based team members. And we have huge infrastructure and we operate in seven locations in Sri Lanka, the, the main location itself is a, is a five acre land where we build a village. And uh, that's basically about uh, dream space. And uh, there's a lot more to talk, but uh, that's basically like how the background of dream space, the behind the scenes of dream space is laying the foundation for the ecosystem services talk that we're gonna have. So if you, anyone, ha, uh, anyone of you has something to ask or say, uh, or like that we can, have it because we have pretty much uh, another 45 minutes time. Oh yeah, 30 minutes, uh, one, one hour time, yeah. Thank you so much, Aravind, for that introduction. And could you share with us a little bit more about um, what ecosystem services mean for you? Um, yeah, like a, so I think this is the, the next stage. This. Yeah, I, the, so okay. basically the next stage. So I just gave a background to 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 what we do, and then so we basically like we go into that topic if uh, that's the only question. So yeah, so first of all about critical making, and then you have been part of that, and uh, you have known this uh, probably uh, you know what it is about. And but for me, we don't use this word the makers. We call it change makers because uh, there was a period of time that I found out um, that maker community, the maker movement is majorly for project-based or hobby makers. They were not solving very fundamental challenges. Yeah. So uh, the critical making was also the, the, the mandate of critical making to, you know, incorporate the scientific knowledge into the, into, into the maker movement to make it, you know, to enhance the movement to create a responsible creation. I mean, that's how we led, that led to the sustainable making. Basically, the sustainable making principles were basically made. And then we, the critical fund making was uh, uh, founded on top of that. And as I said, there was a lot of making happening all around the world. You know, you can see, and uh, there was a time that I was spending uh, in China, uh, living there. And then uh, one of the, the famous China in the maker spaces in China, the founder of the Seed Studio, they told that, you know, there was a period of time, 3,500 maker spaces were built in China within a short one and a half year of time. And then within another one and a half year of time, all these maker spaces were shut down. Why? Because most of the time, the making was not making sense. So uh, that is what we asked this question. Do they make sense? Are they really solving real world problems? You know, are they really sustainable? Because people will just have a 3D printer and print something useless stuff, which is already like available or something like that. It's good for learning, but is it socioeconomically feasible? That can become a product. Is it really selling? It Does it have any unique selling point? And 
And that's how this whole uh, discussion happened. And then in 2019 in Nakuru, uh, part of our uh, gig um, summit, and uh, I was leading this session on, on how to, you know, how to define certain principles. So what are these principles we can define to, uh, uh, to make uh, sustainable making? So uh, for me, a lot of these things we have already understood and that's why we kind of made it moved away from calling ourselves makers we call it change makers and uh and then so we, we i was able to share our knowledge and why we do what we do and then said so that's how these uh five things came you can see that how we have gone through this process of even there are so much of uh, sticky notes and went to this process and as simple as that yeah so make things that make sense. You know, we have to create, we have to create products, either it's a corporate product or grassroots innovations or solutions that that really solve problems, you know. So that is the first sense uh, of thing. Second thing about the huge difference in this type of grassroots innovation is how we make, you know, because corporate innovation, you don't know how they are made. So in most cases, because of that, there are a lot of challenges, you know, repairability or like we don't know what are the ingredients inside that product or the solutions and who are involved and what is their livelihood and so on. So basically like sharing how you make is, is a complete transparent way of like, you know, your innovation. And I hope slowly, like even in the European level policies and this is happening. Sorry, since being in a ground floor, I have a lot of uh, people as a post box and I, sorry, hello. That's yeah. Sorry, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, being in a ground floor is like a post box <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, that's very yeah. funny. Yeah. So uh so that's how we <laughs> so the third thing is uh is as I mentioned, building for continuity. A lot of these mega projects and a lot of these things, they are made just for the short period of time and then they don't they don't think that if that really can actually you know become a product or a solution that can really really solve the challenge for a long period of time and that's the third thing and then what we uh, uh found out that a uh, lot of these innovations grass grassroots innovations have to integrate the local knowledge because uh, coming from different regions uh the people in those regions, they know that the challenge is better than 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 someone sitting somewhere in a in an AC room. So one of the the thing that I can give you like some funny example is that uh, at the early stages of uh, Dream Space, we were working a lot in the human wild elephant conflict, and uh, in Sri Lanka we have around eighty to ninety people uh, are uh, killed by human wild elephant conflict a yearly, and then at the same time four hundred elephants are being killed by people in this conflict. So you don't know that you know that we don't have much elephants in the world than humans and also Sri Lanka has the highest number of Asian elephants in the world like Botswana has the African elephants. And uh, so uh, to protect the rural and the borderline villages uh, with the elephant conflict and there were some organization um uh worked sitting outside of the region and they build a solution okay during the war time there was no electricity also so they said okay they have to build the electric fences uh for wild, wild elephant protection using solar panel uh, uh based uh solutions and at the time it was pretty long time ago so panels were like not very rugged and industrial so they de developed and deployed the solution after some period of time these solutions were not uh not anymore working and it's again third bill for continuity and the fourth is integrate the local knowledge. The problem was that uh, these panels were like very reflective. So in the sunlight, it looks like a mirror. So in jungle, you, all, you don't only have elephants, but you also have other animals like monkeys. So if you show a mirror to a monkey, monkey thinks it's another monkey. So these monkeys in that region, they actually basically destroyed all these solar panels. And so not involving the local people and in, in the development of these kind of solution. INGOs use them for deployment of the solution, but not to develop these solutions is a big challenge. So that's why I said involve or integrate the local knowledge of people because every challenge is going to be different and, and very specific to that region, right? Then coming to the ecosystem services. So ecosystem services now we are going, and then it's more about how 
we can understand what nature provides us and then value that and be and keep uh, uh, that service as part of their product building. So again, we have been talking and using these name ecosystem services for quite some time. So now we go into what it is basically. It is nothing new. It's, an, it's a term that we scientifically gave in the few decades ago and became a policy a few years ago. But it's something is nature. It's a name given for nature and what nature does. And we have been using this for millions of years, but we forgot about this. We don't value that. So we need to create a certain scientific terminology and put it in a policy around that to make people understand why we need ecosystem services and what it is. So ecosystem services, this is like a noun, is, is, are the benefits in the form of goods or products and services we obtain, we get it from the nature. So different types of natural ecosystems, it can be forests, oceans, you know, rivers and animals, sky. So according to the, to the, to the, to the um, uh, millennial assessment, there's an initial UN uh, uh, you informed a, a consortium that they, they, they define around 24 ecosystems that we, we get benefits directly and indirectly. Simplest example, oxygen. We get oxygen, right? It comes from, you know, from different sources and majorly also plants are producing oxygen for us. And, all, and, and, and this is an ecosystem service that we get from that particular plant and you know, different places like forests and jungles. But we don't usually think of this as a service. We just see that this is just there because it's just there, we don't value that. We take it for granted. I'm giving a little bit of bit more example, that well-known example. But you see on the left side is, is natural pollination. Of course, we have like artificial pollination these days, but without these doing this work pollination, we don't have any vegetation, right? So it's a free service. It's not actually free, you know, for our economic system is still considered as a free service that we get from bees so that we can grow crops and we can have food. This is one form of an uh, direct uh, ecosystem services. So since it's a direct and it's known, we talk about protecting these bees and then building bees. But there are so many things which are indirect. That's why we don't know and we don't protect. Or we don't talk about it or we don't include that. The second example on the right side, any one of you can tell what could be the ecosystem service here? Just simple by looking at the image on the right side the shade of the exactly tree. the shadow the shade is provided by the tree for that particular business owner yeah the particular business owner to to sell something let's say it's an ice cream shop yeah that business owner is selling the the, the, the shop is selling an ice cream and the people are sitting under the, under that shade to the shadow to to have this ice cream so if this business owner has to build a proper shade, how much would that cost for that person? Get the license and build that thing and maintain it and, you know, into retract and because in the street and then into, you know, all that cost associated. Cost is the same equal, the cost of that is same as the, as the cost of the shadow provided by this tree. We don't get it for free. It actually has a value. It has a value. This ecosystem, the shadow provided by the tree is a value which should be part of your inventory. All this time in our product and in the human society, we made so many things. Since we, didn't, since we have not yet included the ecosystem services part of the inventory, we were thinking that it's not running out of. Like, you know, as it's not running out. For example, if you have a product where you have, let's say, ice cream, yeah, making ice cream. If you know that milk is in your inventory, you know that milk is running out. You have to order and buy and pay for it. But if that service provided by the natural ecosystem, when you don't have it in inventory, you take it for granted. So you basically don't know if it's there or if it's running out or you need to, to re revive that or to, to pay for it or nothing like that. So that is how the concept of ecosystem services and valuing and accounting these ecosystem services are made. So we can go in more details. Why do we need it? Yeah, 
as, as I mentioned, as humans in the, in the last more than five, 50 years is the last 50 years has been very accelerated that we have made significant damage to our ecosystem because of our demands. So this, and now we understand that we are running out of those natural resources. And so we need to have, we need to evaluate those natural resources to the human engineered infrastructures of good so that it can be part of uh, probably the ingredient label in your product. How many of us have ever asked this question or have seen how much of water has been used in making that particular product? It's an invisible cost. We think that it's, it's renewable and it's there so much or like, you know, it's just there. We don't think about like, you know, basically uh, uh, if it's there or not. So understanding and valuing, evaluating and valuing ecosystem uh, services is a very fundamental thing to sustain this planet and the human and nature well-being. You know, and of course, we cannot just give some monetary value, but in this um, world where economic, economic growth or economical ecosystem is on the top of everything, we have to come up with the, with the methodology to, to give some form of a monetary value so that people understand, people and policymakers and governments. So as I said, let's say this... Uh, this guy is selling a, a ice cream and then the, the material and the production cost of the ice cream is, let's say, one euro. And, and then he has to at least include probably a five cent or two cents of the shadow that is provided. The cost of the shadow is two cents per, per ice cream so that that person can sell probably at one and a half to two euros for that ice cream. Unless you don't value and account for it, you think that it does not exist. And that's why we, the, the policies and the UN and the government ecologists have to create this framework of ecosystem services. Another thing why we need to do that is also to hold responsible, mainly the organizations or so companies and corporates, we need to hold them responsible for their actions, right? So just a step, like a number says, the same ecosystem calculation says that the richest and the developed countries has caused huge environmental damage, which is more than the total depth of the developing nations. So someone did the damage and we are paying for it, right? Some com communities, you know, underserved communities in different parts of the world is paying for it. So if we actually value this and if you account for this, in our products and solutions and services, we will be able to also see like who has contributed and who's trying to resolve and they may, are they being responsible and so on. That is why ecosystem services in business is called natural capital. Like as in a, in a business, when you start, you bring some form of capital, you bring money or you bring a resource, a person or a building, but ecosystem services is also a capital part of a business. That's why it's called natural capital. Okay, what type of ecosystem services uh, we have? The regulating ecosystem services, regulating services, which is the one of the, uh, maybe like the other way around, I will go the provisioning services, which is easy. Provisioning services are direct services, which you get directly, like, you know, food, like water, timber, uh, you know, like whatever the energy from hydro plants and biomass and all those things, we get it directly. So we know that we get it from the nature. So we take care of that little bit. Regulating services are a little bit indirecting. So climate regulation, water purification. Yeah, you can see like, you know, maintenance, the, the disease control by the nature. These are done, the, these are the work that done by the nature, air purification and so on. And this is a regulating services. Since it's very indirect, we don't, care, we don't think about this as something that, you know, we have to take care of. If without the regulating services, you don't have the provisioning services, right? If you don't have the good climate, you don't have the food, good, good crops. And if doesn't, the, the, the regulating services does not control the pest, and then you lose all the, the food. One example, just in the cotton uh, production or in like any kind of a food production also. Cotton, we get it from the nature. So it's the provisional services, we get it directly. But there are certain insects like moths, which are eating the cotton seeds, pods, you know, and they are a lot abundantly, they can grow so much. 
And on top of them, there are certain types of bat. They feed only on this particular type of cotton eating moths. So in a day, they would eat like, you know, few cotton eating moth, uh, moths and this moth eat like few uh, cotton pods. So let's say it's around a uh, few cents. They, they mentioned there's a statistic say that, you know, uh, uh, this loss of cotton pods per day by this moth is something like uh, uh, $20 or something like that. Yeah. And then, and this is controlled, regulated by the bats which are eating this moth. So the work that bat does per day is $20 a day. Are we, are we paying for this bat? No, we don't pay for it. And we don't even care about these bats, you know? So that is how these regulating services are indirectly involved in providing, provisioning the services or things that we need just to sustain in this planet. And then comes cultural services, which is also very direct and indirect like you can talk about spirituality, recreation, and like, you know, working in your forest or even studying scientific studies and tourism and so on, these kind of things. They have immense economic and self personal uh, services and values that we get from these cultural services. A beautiful beach, you know, staying in this cold winter in Germany, people go to a beautiful beach and it just heals them. Then the medicine that they could buy to heal themselves from the depression. So the cost of that service provided by the beautiful beach is same as the medicine, the healthcare system. So you need to, you need to always evaluate, as I said here, you know, so we have to evaluate the natural ecosystem services to compare, you know, to draw equal and comparison to things that we have by human made services and products. Yeah. And then comes the supporting and habit, habit, habitat services or supporting. It's just a foundation of everything because it's happening at a molecular level, like in you know, a nutrition, producing nutrition, oxygen, uh, you know, photosynthesis. These kind of things are happening in a very molecular level, which are foundation of the whole natural ecosystem. So this is how the ecosystem services are classified. Okay, as we spoke, how do we value that? So as we see, there are some direct values, as I've said, like some timber, wood, food, fresh meat, uh, for, uh, fishes and uh, water and whatever that comes directly and indirectly something that is, you know, as I said, like, you know, something that the bat is doing the work to produce these, these things, or it could be also another kind of a food production. And these are some indirect values and non-use values are like they, they also call is a bequest or the, the value, something that you inherit, you know, someone would value that because they think that they're going to get it from their parents or from their community and so on. Otherwise, it's they are not going not, not gonna to think of that, okay, I don't care about this forest or this backyard, I don't care about this small garden, you know. And also the existence values, which are like, you know, just thinking that these uh, wonderful peacocks are existing, we have a, get a kind of a good feeling value, you know, they, they we just that existent value of a natural uh, parts or like kind of places where people think that, okay, because they exist, you know, we, there is a value and we need to pay that money to, to protect those natural parks or like these places or oceans and marine diversity. So this is how the the values ecosystems are valued so in a simple way how do we value things so i have a walnut and i produce walnut and then someone else has beans and i want to always trade my walnut or my product or service and i want to get something uh more than what it costs for me to do you know keep that or to produce that this is the other way on the both side otherwise people will not trade people not value right if these bats uh, eating this moth, the cost of losing those uh, cotton pots for that particular cotton fabric industry is smaller than that they kill or like put pesticide, the cost of putting pesticide to kill all the moths, the people will just put a lot of pesticide. They won't, they won't, they won't care about the, uh, um, the bats. So you always have to have some kind of a balance when you trade these values. It's in a very economic way, yeah? As you can see, we get water, 
from the fresh water from aquifers is a direct value. But to, that water has to become a fresh, some wetland has to do the natural water purification. It's an indirect value. So if you destroy those wetland and build like fancy nice uh, cafes, we basically lose our indirect value also. So as you can see here, there are direct and indirect values of, of, of these uh, things. Okay, now we understood the values, but again, when it comes to bookkeeping or inventory management, we need to account. We need to, when we make business, we need to tell, okay, how do we, how do we make it into a cost? How do we assign or e equal comparison of money with these services? Because you can never put a money for nature, right? You know, if the nature is not there, we are not there. But at this uh, selfish human society, we have to put it because it's on the top of our economic the economic uh, ecosystem is on the top. So replacement cost, how do we account? For example, as I said, um, here I can show you a simple example. If all the bees dies and we need to have some kind of artificial uh, pollination. So how much that money that costs to replace the bee? We have to, uh, this is our way of calculating the cost. So before, uh, this is the other thing you see, like you have a, a postal erosion or wave protection and how much money you need to spend to build uh, these kind of protection with the concrete and this, or how much money you may need to, to grow mangroves, which protects again from the waves and flooding and coastal erosions and so on. So that is what the replacement cost. If the damage has been done, how much we need to, to resolve the damage. Avoided cost. In many places, what would ha even happen if that ecosystem does not exist? We, even before the damage happens, yeah? Avoiding the cost, avoiding the damage being the the damage being happening. For example, if you have the, if we kill all of, if you destroy all of our, you know, in a way, wasteland habitats, and then, you know, how many, water treatment plants we have to build and what would be the cost. It's basically before that happened, we avoid that. Factor income is something that enhancement cost. So having this, uh, you know, basically like uh, if you have a good, let's say water quality, yeah? if, it's a, if it's a product, someone is selling a water as a product and if they protect that ecosystem and they're gonna get a good quality groundwater, and then they have to do some kind of incentives to people to, to make the people, the company has to do something to make that, uh, to keep the, and protecting the ecosystem. That's the income and factor income. The travel cost, it's a very interesting aspect. Every product that we have, that we use, the, more, the big part of the cost of that product is actually the transportation cost, if you just think about it. Even if it's a material, raw material sold in one place, it's the transportation cost of taking and digging that material or transporting from one part to another part. This is the biggest cost of every product that human made is the transportation cost. So they say that the same way, if I takes 30 minutes and let's say five euros for me to go and travel from here to a nice, wonderful lake, where I can relax for the whole day with my family, the cost of the value that is provided by the lake is my transport cost, the travel cost. It should be, we have to come up with some valuation, right? This is one of the way of doing it. Of course, someone will be coming far from and someone will be coming from nearby and they have to find a regression and an economic model. What would be the cost to use that lake? And that's how these national parks are also calculating the cost based on the travel cost. The ecosystem services are you know, made in that way. And the other one uh, is hedonic pricing. This is also something um, um, you can call it as a house that you have at the beach will have a different value than a house that is far away from the beach. Why? Because of the view that beach provides. It's an aesthetic value and the feel that it provides. So there is a cost associated with that. Just imagine that people buy a fancy uh, apartment at the coastal marine drive, and then the next someone comes and build a big wall. Will the value be the same? No, we will not pay the same price for the same apartment, which blocks our view from the ocean or the sea. And the other last uh, condition is that they say, 
ask common people, how much do you want to pay or like to contribute to the natural ecosystem of your neighborhood or country? And then you can derive some values from that and cost and then include into that ecosystem accounting. So as you can, I have seen, I have given you some example of like, how do we account? And uh, as I have mentioned that, yeah, building a, if, uh, uh, if building a water treatment plant does not provide uh, um, uh, uh, the cost of building a water treatment plant is, is, is more than the, the, uh, the cost of uh, keeping the wetland nearby for water filtration, then we should actually go for the wetlands to, to keep, you know, of course the production capacities may not be the same, but then we need to think and plan accordingly to create or to protect more wetlands and, and so on. And, and then there should be some way of payment systems, right? So if you put values for our nature, who is paying, who is collecting, who, from where it goes to whom, do we let the corporate companies to do this job? No. So we need to have to create a certain payment system between the producer and consumer of these ecosystem services. One big example, this is an actual example happening, I think, uh, Honduras or somewhere in, in, uh, in the Latin America. People living downstream were affected by the coffee producers upstream where they were dumping a lot of the waste and then like, you know, chemicals into that. So the people downstream are a little bit uh, economically resourceful people. People upstream who are working in the farms are like not economically resourceful people. So these people downstream and the government, the policies were involved and they said, instead of you try to fix your uh, problems and pollutions and this and that downstream, you can fix it upstream by going to those people upstream who are farm workers and giving them a good payment to protect this, the ecosystem above so that they can also sustain their values uh, to their life, livelihood, so that your nature, that you don't have any other work or any other payment to do downstream to protect your ecosystems. So this has been successful in many countries, such payments have been uh, facilitated. And then of course the value has to match if not, you know, if you pay something like less money than that they can make by like dumping more waste, is they're going to keep doing it. And so you have to think of that. And then there is a way of measuring that and you have to come. And it's form of a tax or it's a form of a, a contribution or it's form of an insurance that the people downstream, well resourceful people have to pay to keep the ecosystem well so that the people... Uh, in the upstream can access a producer to help and protect their ecosystems. So, as I said, in the final uh, uh, part of the sustainable making is including this ecosystem services. So when we are making sustainable, sustainable creation, not the hobby creation, we need to think whether and where and how we can include the ecosystem services how we can create products or goods and solutions and services using and utilizing and giving back to this ecosystem services because to ecosystem. For that, we need the framework of ecosystem services. Some of the few projects that I can tell, like, you know, we had um, a very young girl whom we identified in a very um, um, jungle region, a village forest region. And uh, there, uh, as you might know that, in most of the developed and developing nation, even in Germany, Germany, Germany has the second lowest groundwater quality in Europe because of agriculture fertilizer. So if Germany has this, just imagine that there are other countries in the global south. So this pollutions and nitrate and phosphate and also pollutions coming from metallic pollutions from pipes and tubes and so on are, are, are one of the dangerous water pollutions, you know. So a girl in that region whom we identified as a change maker, uh, she identified that, that Java plum is a certain type of a fruit in South Asia and Southeast Asia also. Uh, the seeds of the Java plum has a high concentration of uh, iron oxide particles. So basically this biomass, basically this material abundantly available from the nature, not cultivated, abundantly available in the nature in her ecosystem is acting as a 
can act as a water filtration to remove cadmium ions in the water. Cadmium pollutions are coming also, again, as I said, the agriculture fertilizers and also metallic pipes. So in this way, they value the service that is provided by these Java plum trees. Otherwise, people just don't know, like, you know, just, just in the nature, you know, they don't value this tree. You know, they just use it and eat it and throw this thing, but it is doing a job. So once you know the value and you can e make an equal comparison to what it would cost for us to create inorganic nanotechnology or biofilters, nanotech filters to filter out this pollution and also deploy them into the, all this remote region, it is a massive cost that we can basically, you know, avoid, so avoid the cost by just using this uh, ecosystem. Also, it's a replacement cost. The, another thing that uh, like biocomposite materials, and we have a lot of uh, services provided by starch and fibers in the nature that can provide like materials that we can make. We don't have to only make non-degradable plastic uh, materials. So one of them is that we have been working with the mycelium, the mushroom, to enable as a binder, to act as a binder connector between these biomass to produce certain material otherwise we have to use some other uh, inorganic things to do the job and also using mycelium or mushroom in our region in a high high humid region is a, is a, is a better ecosystem service because people also grow the same by mycelium material here in europe for that they have to create a microclimate condition, humid condition, pay for electricity, pay for this, pay for that. But in our region, we are getting it from our nature and mycelium symb uh, symbiotically working together to do the job, yeah? So this is one, one of the way that we include those services into our grassroots innovations. Recently, we have worked a lot in this bioplastic project, a uh, team of team member of us. And if you know Palmyra uh, plant tree, which is abundantly available in the dry coastal regions of, of our country, and uh, it's not cultivated in a one square kilometer, you will find like a like a hundred thousand Palmyra tree. It's like a palm trees with their like a coconut. They have a pulp inside, and they drop all the way. You will find it in Africa also. And then uh, we actually found a way to make a biodegradable bioplastic uh, from this pulp. With that, we also have to create a community of young women in that region who are collecting, because it's not cultivated. You know, it's collecting these uh, palm fruits and they also provide the dried palm uh, leaves, which are used for like fencing and like, you know, for fuel and so on. People don't pick it up because they are not cultivated it's in different, different places. By enabling them, by giving them a, you know, job to collect this, and they also collect other things, which, which, which would be, you know, making a socioeconomic value, which again, we get it from the ecosystem service of palm tree. Palm tree from the top to the root is valuable. It does the job of protecting the coastal region. It does the job of like, you know, providing these kind of fruits and, and kind of, you know, when they are like not pulpy and they have a water inside. So it's a dry land. So it provides the water and nutrients and so on. And, in, and people don't care about palm trees because they are like everywhere. They have like kind of thorns. And now when we include these ecosystem services of the palm tree and make product and people will start to care and take care of them. And they will see there is an economic benefit of taking care of them. And then they do, that's the whole concept of ecosystem service valuing and account, accounting that. The, la, the another one is this dung beetle, you know, like, you know, we have one biogas project, you know, region where there's a lot of cattle, uh, cows and this and buffaloes and so on. And we started creating a decentralized biogas digester to for houses to, you know, collect these 50 kilograms of dung and then do but at the same time the dung the wet dung is very difficult to carry and also to use it as a as a fertilizer naturally this is a job done by a dung beetle they roll it they dry it they move it to a place and so you know it's not that one they, there's a region in our that there are hundred thousands of cattle and animals and if they put all the droppings in one place the amount of nitrate going to the soil will be so high but with this way 
the, the beetle is doing the job of separating it, rolling it, making a pellet and moving it away. So we could actually sell this as a, as a pellet, fertilizer pellets. It's a service provided by these beetles. So in this way that we have a lot of different ways that we are including uh, by ecosystem services. And one of that, I'm just giving you how we also include uh, humans, as I mentioned, the palm project, the ocean biome, the ocean project. The coastal line that we are based is it used to be highly diverse and, and corals and then during the war time because of a lot of bombs and bombs testing and missile testing, a lot of the corals have died. And after the war ended and it started like reviving itself and but we have natively uh, native ocean mammals which is protecting the whole regions and ocean mammals like you know like sharks and then we have the manta rays and then below that we have seahorses which is like you know below that is a seagrass seagrass is sequestering 20 times more uh, carbon than the the forest uh, that you would find and so on and then people started like uh, illegal fishing vegetables started catching the mammals, the top one, and then one by one, everything collapsed. People don't have fishes, and when they don't have fishes, so the fishing village is sitting idle, and when they sit idle, they go and create a conflict with other people. You know, that's the whole concept of socioeconomic and environmental challenges. So the Hopspot is a project uh, started by Sylvia Earle, if you know the famous uh, godmother of ocean, uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle and then uh, Mission Blue, and they created a, a Hopspot program all around the world is to take a certain part of the uh, ocean region and instead of, and you might have fishermen there. And so you basically make it non-fishing region. And people would like, and I said this to my, like our region fishermen, they said, oh, you take our job and livelihood. And I asked them the same question. How like, they are like, you know, in this uh, one of the fishing village, they have been fishing for ages and so on, and some 40 years and old fishermen and so on. They said, okay, if I give you how much you make this money, and they said a certain number of money, if I give you double this money, would you still go for fishing and think that fishing is such a normal human uh, job that you have been doing for thousands of years? He said, no. If there's a money, I will be happily taking care of my family and doing the other job. I don't have to fish. The whole point is always about money. The hope spot is what is exactly doing is converting poachers and fishermen into protectors of these ecosystems. And where do they get the money is basically providing ecotourism and, and you know, rehabilitation projects and so on that brings more value and more money than, than fishing. So they become the protector. It's a successful all around the world. There are hub spots and they were like, you know, rehabilitated poachers and people have been illegal fishing uh, people organizations. Now they have become the, uh, the protectors. They're protecting the ecosystem because ecosystem is giving a value that they get the direct livelihood. So that is the whole point of ecosystem services and why we need to know, learn, understand value and account these ecosystem services. This is ecosystems and services and existed millions of years in this planet, but we need to now include these ecosystem services in our creation of goods and services. That's it. Thank you. Give some virtual applause. Thank you so much, Alvin. That was very inspirational, very interesting to hear how you're doing it and what the bigger picture of ecosystem services um, discussions is in the world. And I would like to invite everyone, if you have questions, uh, to share them in the chat. Uh, I see some, some nice um, claps um, also in the from the community present. Uh, also, you can raise your hand if you want to speak um, in the session uh, live. So please let me know. And I have one question um, where it would interest me so much, uh, how you give back to the ecosystem uh, in dream space. Like how do you, like on the very practical example, I don't know, of the bioplastic from palm trees, for example, um, what is the giving back and how do you account for it in the product cost? So as, as we, this is also like a new, uh, uh, pretty new thing for us. And we have mm -hmm. been learning how we can, uh, because we have also not reached to a level that we have a mass uh, product. So as I said, that the giving in terms of the pulp, Palmyra thing, you know, 
normally these the how we are giving back is is that we are becoming a, we are enabling the producers of the or the protectors of the ecosystem services these trees were not valued they were cut down destroyed and if you look at the when the tsunami happened not even one of these trees fell at that 75 feet tsunami that happened in our coast where 100000 people died and not even one fell so by giving a, a value for these people to take out of the ecosystem services they are being the protectors of these ecosystems and that is how we give back we can give back also uh, directly by planting more uh, palm trees uh, palmyra trees but it does not make sense because it's naturally grown and we don't want to create that in some places we can we can actually uh, increase the population for example the dung beetle you know the dung beetle has disappeared uh, i have when i was a child i've seen that everywhere rolling all the dung and moving to the road from the road the cows are putting the dung and they will roll it and move it to the roadside you know but now they are disappeared so we can basically and carefully bring back the population because you also have you cannot just bring them billions of them and you have to bring back the population that's how we are reintroducing or giving back to the nature you know so these are the these are the examples of uh, of uh, like as i said um, uh, with the ocean project that now we are talking about like the ocean biome was a spin off that I, I mentioned the story of sanjeev and then we are doing a lot of ocean education, ocean advocacy, and we are also talking about how we can replant the corals again, because coral is also protecting the waves and, uh, and, uh, and internally the whole carbon sequestration is uh, carbon trapping is happening. If the coral is alive and the seagrasses are alive, things are happening. And so this is also something that we directly get involved and replant and redo things. Yeah, thank you. That's very instructing. Uh, Vuga is raising his hand. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, this is my second time to be in the same rooms uh, with him because uh, I remember in 2019, we are in the same rooms uh, developing uh, the principle of uh, uh, critical making, and of which we are now in the face of uh, action. So mine is a, a basic, uh, uh, his story is so uh, attached with mine uh, as a refugees, and there were so many things. And uh, I think uh, what we are doing here is uh, we are changing life for the community. And um, I, I wanted him uh, to stress more uh, ecosystems, like uh, to, to be one of the approach for uh, a peace building. So I wanted him to not a little bit uh, how people should understand the peace buildings and ecosystem. So, yeah. So you want, uh, this is, a, yeah, hi, Voga, glad to see you again. I don't see you, but uh, yeah, I remember the discussions that we had. And um, um, as I mentioned that, you know, it's everything for us is falling back to the peace building effort uh, because that's the foundation of what we have started. As, a, as, as an organization working on a lot of conflict resolution, rehabilitation, hate speech mitigation, fake news, uh, you know, you know, all type of peace building efforts happening parallel to what we do. And as I mentioned that one of the challenge is that if someone loses their livelihood and then they are just sitting most of the, just I can give my coastal region that, you know, uh, they, we don't have motorized board, which was because during the war time, we were not allowed to use anything motorized. And uh, that's why we still have some parts of the ecosystem which are not damaged. And then the other countries where they have a crawlers which just destroyed the whole ocean bed. And um, um, so people are just still like, you know, like just like putting a huge net and then, then they uh, pull it from the coastal region like in Africa also. And, uh, and they catch fish, a big amount of fish only twice or thrice in a year. So throughout the year, just sitting doing nothing. They're just waiting for a big uh, herd of fish to be found and then they catch and then they make some, some money to survive. So when these people are just lying down under the coconut tree and their idle mind, they always want to go on to fight with someone. You know, it's an idle mind is a devil's workshop. So that's how when keeping them engaged and keeping them, giving them some task of protecting this ecosystem, keeping them engaged is basically not making them go and fight with someone else so it's it's uh it is a form of uh you know peace building so we call it and it works it works and uh yeah 
Yeah, Thank I think so much. so so much. What also Vuga is doing um, is connecting so much to the ecosystem services question, like the amazing open source modular housing, um, like Haringia satellite uh, house uh, that they built. Um, we're using the natural resources like the sand um, to create, like the earth, uh, to create the houses and not create it from concrete, like uh, it would nowadays be the norm. So, Luga, do you want to share something about that? Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much. I think um, when I, I come back from uh, Nakuru, I was uh, sitting down as a refugee looking to how refugees also will really contribute to the existence and uh, because uh, uh, where we settle, we normally uh, use a lot of freeways and uh, cutting down street and which how much we plan, but it still not change the people's mind. So um, I'm not engineer, but um, from the questions like a principles, make things that people can also adopt and use. And I have an idea in way back, uh, our grandfather normally built a house without cement, and but the, the house is there. It's on that people do, do not do documentation about it. Then um, when we created that and uh, using cement and local materials and marams and of which put little, uh, uh, cement. So we make a, a framework with like a box whereby four by four rooms. So something that will make a hole, then we pour the mix of uh, material inside, then we ramp it. So it, 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 it works. It is now a house where young people normally come together, interact, and uh, we use the space for ICT training. And uh, we have also architecture library, none of which. Uh, the book also give uh, inspiration to the community and people normally come together. So it make it easier to organize a workshop. You don't go to door to door. So people normally come, what is new? And it get people doing things and people forget about like uh, trauma healings. It, to me, myself, I also benefit a lot from the project. I feel like I'm also learning things because um, my education levels, I don't go to the university, I think, uh, if you put education and what you do is a, is a different things and of which in direct way people will uh, uh, appreciate what you're doing. So uh, if young people come together and look at that an avenue to turn them their mindset because if we go back to South Sudan, we have a lot of things to do. And not only that, some of the things like a hate speed education, all uh, those stuff, but uh, how do you look at your livelihood? How do you change your community? How do you also take a lead to, to fight? Then those are also things that if young people come together and uh, learn. So those are the things. Again, um, I'm also creating things in looking to the uh, demolition house, um, whereby it polluted environments, uh, these uh, bricks, like uh, if, for example, if a house, uh, demolish downs like let's take earthquake. Then where does all those uh, materials go? Those wasted products. So when I sit down and I, I I just came out with the rebuff bricks. So um, it's also under critical making, and uh, I'm also working with uh, Ukrainians so that uh, my idea was selected. And then uh, I think. Uh, this is something uh, what people can make it from collaborations, then it changes so that uh, later on, I also I have to introduce myself as a maker change. How do we make that? And then who is there? That person I'll say the idea will do documentation whenever I'm far away. So uh, this is something we have been doing. And uh, if we have um, online meeting like this, and if people can really consume and take it, then I think uh, we are going to be uh, eco-friendly to our environment. So that is it. And that is a brief of what I have. And uh, However, uh, tomorrow I'll be in Kampala to, to check my visa. When it is out, I think I'll be in the Republicans and uh, uh, to one of the market space so that to, to say a lot, then ideas, the crazy ideas, so that we can develop something. So hope to see you there if all goes well by tomorrow. Thank you.
over. Fingers Glad crossed so here. much for you. I uh, hope that works out. Um, and I see, uh, uh, sorry, I haven't, did you want to? Answer no, I mean, glad, great, great to hear. Like, as I said, like, uh, uh, when you come to Berlin, definitely, I, I don't have any ticket to Republica, maybe if sunrise there anyway, that if I can come, I can be there. Otherwise, uh, Vuga, you can come uh, and we can meet outside of Republica and uh, we can talk. And I mean, as you mentioned, how you build houses, which are very, you're integrating other, so to say that all that five principles of sustainable making, integrating the local knowledge and even in the regions that uh, where we're operating and, and traditionally and how people were building is using this kind of, um, you know, type of fencing. And then, then they put the clay and, and the cow dung is used as insulation on one side to, to keep it, keep the houses cool. And since we have a lot of uh, turmeric, you know, the curry powder, uh, which grows, uh, the turmeric plant grows a lot and they uh, grind it and then apply it to the house because turmeric is antibacterial and antiviral. You know, this is the people have done for uh, thousands of years, and then we lose that, uh, you know, with with the time. So that's that's all the call, whole concept of sustainable making. Yeah, please, uh, Sarah and Patricia. Hi, thank you so much from both of us for this really, really incredible and inspirational um, presentation. It's it's beyond words what what you on an individual level but also with your community and with the people that you work with all that you've lived through and all that you've experienced that you've been able to turn that into something so positive and so impactful for your community but also on a global scale you know really um bringing so many different topics together in such a holistic way to move something so forward and this um this change maker approach that you're taking of looking at what are the individual what is an individual's person's passion their 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 dream their desire and what they would like to do and then giving them access to the resources of um, what they need to learn who they need to know and then also creating also these more collective spaces of bringing people together to then also bring their different ideas together it's 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 phenomenal it's really really incredible and so this is more a comment rather than a question and just a huge congratulations to you and your team of everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Sarah and Patricia. I don't know who that's. I can just uh, undersign that. Uh, and I would read the last question we have um, before we say goodbye, which is uh, from Julia. How do you get people aware of ocean ecosystems uh, if they live far away from the sea? So as I, as I said that, it's the our change maker process. People who are actually victims of a challenge are the people who are the right people to solve the challenge. It would not make sense for me and for us to bring someone who has a wild elephant conflict in a jungle to come and solve the ocean problem because there are enough people at the ocean they should know and be aware and then solve those challenges. So we don't we don't actively make it as an awareness for our people, inland people. But somehow by looking at the media and you know, coverage and a lot of youngsters who are also from the mountains, they come and they say that because they want to do that. But we only focus on people who are, uh, as I mentioned, if they are the victims and if they are in that ecosystem, they know in and out of that, that they need these solutions. And uh, yeah. Thank you for that answer. And um, that's also very... Very instructing. And I would love to uh, invite everyone to think about, like, do you use any of these ecosystem services that you now uh, heard about in your products, in your spaces? And maybe also think about, like, how could you account for them or how um, maybe you are already giving back um, to the ecosystem that you're using. Maybe you could give back more um, through this kind of protection. And I would really like to read these kind of follow-ups uh, in our mentoring program uh, WhatsApp group um, and uh, also read about your stories, um, what you're 
yeah, thinking about uh, the session uh, after it closed. So I think, I think again, Arvind. Yeah, so I think like everyone is using it, everyone, absolutely. I, we I just so. don't consciously uh, be aware of that we are using it because it's not in our inventory of product and services. So just it is the moment to make it, uh, you know, conscious. And I think like even in the German parliament, uh, they have been I may have been passed uh, of uh, to include the carbon um, CO2 emissions in the product ingredients. And then I think also there are some suggestions to have how much of water has been used. So it will be in the label. So like this, I think in future, I can imagine every product will have product will have label with this used invisible uh, ecosystems and their services. And I hope that's going to happen sooner or later, the policy level. Yeah, that's uh, definitely the most important step also to make it uh, applicable to bigger uh, businesses and bigger um, companies that certainly wouldn't do it if there is no prescription to do it. Um, thank you again, Arvind. That was uh, an amazing session and I'm looking forward uh, to share it with the world uh, in just a few days. And I wish everyone uh, a great rest of your day and uh, speak to you very soon in the internet.